The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This episode is brought to you by Capital Group, one of the oldest and largest asset management companies in the world, managing multi-asset, equity and fixed income investment strategies for different types of investors. Since 1931, Capital Group has been singularly focused on delivering superior, consistent results for long-term investors using high conviction portfolios, rigorous research and individual accountability. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Wrigley and today I've got the pleasure of speaking with David Harris from Advice Evolution. We're going to tackle the topic of changing licensees uh, in in a minute. But uh, David, thank you for joining me. Thanks for uh, I guess agreeing to come onto the podcast. Great to have you here. Oh, good day, James. It's uh, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for getting me on. I you know look, I like the whole concept of podcasts. We uh, we do a couple of podcasts ourselves within within the license, and it's a um, the whole ensemble ideal is uh, really resonates with us, so uh, you know it's great to be on board. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a fantastic group to be to be part of. The amount of uh, sharing and so forth that goes on, whether it's in the on the uh, on the web um, app there the, in the community, the podcasts that go out, it's yeah. uh, it's it's a big machine these days. And then uh, the PD day that's coming up on Friday, this will this this uh, this podcast will probably go live after the PD day has been held, but. Um, Plenty of people coming along to that too. So thanks, thanks for joining me. Um, I guess we we tend to like to start the podcast with a, a bit of uh, looking back and on, on your career and so forth. I was saying just before we started recording that I that I had a look at your um, your LinkedIn profile and it talks a little bit about a couple of things that you did. Um, you started off in, in military and and when I read the line there about some time in the military, there, there seems to be a quite a fair few people in financial advice that have gone on to a a level of success in in different forms in financial advice that have come from the military. Um, so, to maybe talk us through your you know your work experience and what's gotten you to where you are now. Yeah, James. Well, I originally yeah I did some time after school. Like uh, you know I, I went, went into gun train and um, I found the uh, the military life quite exciting. You know, it's a it's one of those things where you're living with your friends, you're you know, traveling, you're fit, you're just doing all of the most incredible things every single day. <laughs> and uh, it, it was amazing, but it's a single man's job. Yes, um, I uh, I met my my current wife, and uh, we were deciding to um, about where we'd settle and have children. But uh, and my mother had a my mum had a um, little insurance business up in uh, in Gyra, actually in northern New South Wales. And uh, she basically rang me up one day and she said, "I'm leaving. You can have it if you want. I'll leave the <laughs> on the desk." And sort of we uh, you know had a bit of a discussion about that. My wife was working for one of the fundies in uh, in in the city and uh, Rothschilds, I think, at the time. And uh, we um, we backed up and moved to the country, which was uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, right. But it was just a basically it was a GI book, uh, essentially with a little bit of risk and some um, you know those uh, complex super policies that were going around back in the day, and um, and so we, we we took over that, and that was as financial planning was getting going. And I did my my RG one four six, I think one week yeah you know, one week in Sydney. <laughs> and I was I was let loose on the on the public. Anyway, I, I had a um, a pretty successful practice in financial planning there over uh, quite a few years. And um, and as I was telling you before, I um, I tried to we, we used to work on the actual business side of it and work work out what change we could actually do into our business to make it more profitable and make it contemporary. You know, we were doing you know soft files and all that sort of stuff. 15 years ago, but we um, we shopped it here one, and then one year we uh, we we put our Put it all together. Uh, we shopped it, and um, somebody bought it. So I retired yeah. twelve years ago, twelve thirteen years ago. And uh, some very good friends of mine, Grant Simpson and Anthony Stedman, rang up and said, "Look, David, we need to get out of our vertically integrated uh, current licensing model. Can you help us? You know, can you run the license for us so we can can still run our practice? Um, you know, it could be a couple of days a week, six or seven advisors. It'll be easy." They said. I think we're sitting at uh, just under seventy yeah. advisors now and forty six practices. So um, it's a little bit busier than I thought. So had you had so so prior to you know going out and, and setting up Advice Evolution, had you had any experience in on the licensing side of financial advice? 
Well, so I was, um, I ran the, uh, so we were in Financial Wisdom, which was one of the CBA licensees at the time. And I was actually on the, uh, I was the chair of the advisor forum okay. for quite a few years. And so I got a little bit of an insight as to what they were doing, albeit that, uh, that license was a juggernaut and uh, it was, you know, got quite large there at a while. And, you know, there was all that influence of the mixed licenses because Combank, Combank had count, I think, at that stage mm-hmm. and um, Pathways and CBA financial planning. But I did get a really good insight as to what was going on. Yep. Okay. And and so a lot of the bank licenses have, you know, in, in one way, shape or form, been kind of wound down as... As, uh, as as financial advice has moved on over the last few years from you know, the Royal Commission and all the rest of it, do you get a sense of where most of those people have have, have landed? Like where where are they licensed now? Lots have gone on their own. Lots joined groups like yours. Like where where are people getting their license from these days? You yeah, look, it's a funny thing, James. And I um, look, they're, they're, it's a mix. They've gone to a lot of places. A lot of guys have tried it on their own. Um, there, there's some bigger ones. Some of the bigger. Um, independent style licensees I think they ended up going for it. So I think they all realised that it was time to go out. Not many of them fell back to or to the IWF or to the AMP style model. And so that's um that's what we found. We 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 had, being as naive as we were at the time when we started up, we um, we had a couple of fund managers that we had a large piece of work with put handcuffs on us when we first started the license and they said, look, you need to stop stealing advisors from this location, otherwise <laughs> we will stop paying you. And we went can you do that? And we didn't have the resources, the skills, or the courage to take them on. Yeah. So basically, we just they slapped the handcuffs on us and we waited. Fortunately, it was FOFA at the time, and FOFA slowed everything down quite significantly. Later, after FOFA, after the FOFA rules died down a little bit, we had a bit of an influx of advisors, but they'd actually been in over at that, that FOFA period, I think, in the larger vertically integrated licensees, didn't help them a lot. There was a lot of rules, a lot of back testing of their advice. That fee for no service, there was just a lot of punishment. And so the advisors have come out and they're just gun shy, scared, yeah, just not trusting of, of anybody. And that's and it's just you know, so it's made it difficult for them to to fit into you know the old collegiate um, environment that uh, you know we, we remember licensees as being. So we're trying to sort of rebuild that. But, uh, but, but yeah, look, ultimately, we, we took a big swag of people yeah, okay. um, just at the end of FOFA, but, uh, but yeah, they've gone to a lot of places. I know four of them got, got mm. up a big whack of them too, which is good. So you, so when you first started out, what, how, how many years ago did you did you start the license? Um, 2001, so that's 12 years. 12 years ago, ago. yeah. And, and just a, a few people, three or four people at the start? Yeah, two practices. Okay. Um, so there was yeah, the two practices that we spoke about, but then we actually we had a few others. So there was a um, a group in Queensland, um, you know, four or five practices in Queensland, just individual um, advisors that joined up with us, and, and a couple in Melbourne, and that sort of got us going. And, uh, and we sort of realised that. Uh, so well, then we started looking further afield and uh, and recruiting. I remember our, our target was eighteen for eighteen, so we wanted eighteen advisors in two thousand eighteen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you're and you're seventy or so now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And how many how many firms is that? 46. 46. And so, look, the, uh, and the, the difficult thing was at the moment is that um, advisors are finding it hard to leak because they're leaking from the industry. You've got, and people leaking steadily from the bigger ones, a lot of them going self licensed, but actually looking into other licensee spaces is, is hard for them because it's just, it's, I find I'm sitting with licensees that are completely different to us, but we all tell the advisor the same story. And the hard bit is for them to work out who to believe. And uh, and it's so difficult to change licenses. Yeah, you don't want to do it too often. No, and we'll offer you, obviously if you do it too often, it shows up on the far register, and your clients go, well, "Hey, why are you keep yeah, changing licenses?" It starts to look a little bit, a little bit funny, doesn't it? And yeah, people starting to ask, "What's going on here?" It is. It becomes yeah, it just becomes difficult, and uh, and and that's uh, that's just like any sales sort of game. But um, you know, we've we try to put our spiel together, and we try to uh, be true to it. Mm. And, uh, you know, this is pretty simple because. Uh, you know, we've sort of set up a, um, a thing that we can deliver and, and now all of our advisors are completely aware of it as well. So we've got a, you know, a reasonably different um, offering, which is good. Yeah. And now I was, I was reading on your website, do you have a model where you know, the, the, the advisors that are operating on their license can ultimately own part of the licensee business? Is it something that you're doing? Yeah, that, that's exactly it, James. So that's one of the things. So we, we place our business on four pillars. Mm. One of the pillars is equity and control. What we allow is that they have to control their own business. They, they get full control of their business, but they've also got they can have equity in the license if they wish. Now it's not compulsory, and they still have to buy it at whatever the market rate is at the time. 
But what I find is now that once I've got, and, and you know, this is the way we, we built it in the first place. If I'm coming to see you as the advisor and I'm doing my supervisory check or we're doing, um, you know, a, a file check or something like that, you're actually want to be more involved. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're actually saying, but, David, but what about this? You, you need to be looking into this space because, you know, you're worried about the license just as much as I am because we're all on the hook. And uh, it makes it, you know, it just really makes it much more pleasant when you're going to visit your business partners as opposed to the dr- draconian master servant sort of type of arrangement that you're used to in a licensee. Yeah, you're kind of dreading when the auditor comes in and go, oh, no, what are we, what are we in for now, this kind of thing. But you're, you're involved with it uh, as, as a business owner. That makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And they've got, you know, we, everyone's still got a, you know, quite a strong work. We don't have that many. Like we've still got 32, I think, unit holders in the, in the unit trust that owns the license. And so. Yeah. And so you've still got a pretty loud voice. <laughs> So look, let's get into the process of changing changing license as we as we mentioned before, as you commented to say it's something you you don't want to do too often if you can if you can avoid it. So if you are, are looking to you know, uh, change your licensee, you ideally want to try and get that right to begin with. But maybe if we can start to get into the process. So you know, we we spoke before we started recording. I, I have no idea about what's involved in changing a license. I've I've worked in this business for you know, for fifteen years or so. We've we were self licensed. We went to someone else. We're now self licensed again. But that's something. That's something that someone else has dealt with. Not 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 me. Uh, it's not a single advisor practice here. So so what's the process involved in in changing a license? I, I'm sick of these group that I'm working with. I want to come and join you. What what happens? Where do we even start? Yeah. So it's a uh, it is a it's a reasonably convoluted uh, process. Fortunately, we've got a um, we've got a team specifically that aimed at doing that. In that but uh, you know, we, we outsource a lot of our business to the Philippines, but we've been doing that for eight years now. Yep. So we've got a couple of people that have been there for the whole process. And so um, they know how to do this really, really well. But the idea is to find out what you really want. And you'll find out, and, and, and you've got to look carefully into the actual license that you're looking at. And so, for example, we, um, we you know, we put our you put ourselves out of there not having a conflict. You know, admittedly, we still pay risk commissions or accept risk commissions, but apart from that, you know, we don't have any alliance with any, any product. And the reason to do that, because one of our pillars is no conflict. But what you've got to do is look at the new license and say, well, you know, are they pushing into a product? Who's actually paying the license? Is, are, they, are they subsidized completely by advisor fees or is it a product supplying it and that sort of stuff? So you've got to do your due diligence on your license. And I think that's really important, understanding how many people have left it you know why getting a um, um, a referral from getting a um, having a yarn to someone who's actually in the license has a similar practice to you, which is it, it is a really really valuable valuable tool. But then what you've got to do is once you've decided what license you're actually looking at, the hard bit is you've got to resign, and so you've got to pull your representative your authorized rep agreement out and have a look at what they're going to put on you when it comes time to resign, yeah. how much notice you've got to get, and all that sort of stuff. Some licensees get really angry. And they think, no, I'm going to make this as hard as I possibly can, and they start putting hoops in. Some of them say, oh, cool, you know, we'll help you out. We don't want a bad, uh, we don't want a bad taste in uh, in anyone's mouth. We don't want you to the tearing around saying, yeah, this is a horrible experience. So they uh, they're reasonably amenable. But um, so the next step is, yeah, so you find you resign, and then they'll come into you and they'll tell you what you're going to require in your um, in your transfer, um, your standard transfer agreement. In your transfer agreement, they'll need you to write to your clients to sell them that you're leaving. Um, some of them will want you to put uh, on a copy of all your files, and uh, some of them will put a requirement for you to do new SLAs on your clients. And that's the interesting one, that one. That's the, the the complicated one. Some people like to do it, some people don't, but you're still being sort of pushed around a little bit. Then there's a matter of just moving all of your codes um, coming over and any software. So if you've been an X plan person and the new people use Advisor Logic or they don't use anything, then you, know, you have to decide. No. What you're going to use is your CRM in the future. Mm. Easier these days, I think, because we have less clients. Much easier because we have less clients and you don't have that much of a trail. The uh, the product providers are really slow in moving your money over and they'll keep paying the old licensee for a couple of months just because they're hopeless. But uh, as a general rule, most of the, uh, the the money comes across reasonably quickly. So just on that, that advice requirement there, um, as I said, I have no experience really in changing license from one to another. Are there some new licensees that won't require you to um, issue a new statement of advice under the new license to, to your existing clients? Absolutely. Yeah, right. 
it, it, it seems to me that yeah, it's somewhat draconian and barely in the client's best interest for them to get in wood, have to write out this new SLA, especially if the advice is still current and the advisor is still the same. So um, that's generally it's the outgoing one which will ask you to do that. So they'll say, yeah, let's put in a, um, a I need an SLA anyway, because they want to transfer the liability. Yeah, okay. It's all a PI thing. So if I if the PI is on my license, then I'm on the hook for that advice as long as it exists on that SLA. When there's a new SLA, it moves the the risk, the PI risk to the new license. Ah, so that's a, ah, so that's the break if if I'm going from licensee A to licensee B in terms of the insurance part. It's when the new SLA is issued. Is that the yeah, well, that's that the, the advice. Yeah, essentially. okay. And so it's a it's a funny one, and I'm not sure it has been tested. But if you write, so if your exiting license says you have to do a um, an SLA on all of your clients, and you don't do it, and if there's a complaint on one that you didn't do, then the liability would fall back to the previous licensee. But they could say, but hang on, you signed a, signed a contract to say that you do an SLA, so I don't know what had actually happened there. From yeah, that right. I I always thought the advice requirement was the new licensee, um, but it's. It's more the old one wanting to sever the liability rather than rather than the new one taking over. You know, my PI broker tells me, yeah, you don't want them to do SOA. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then the liability less, rests with the other group, not yours. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And then- the- well, There's so few PI brokers, PI uh, insurers at the moment. I think the, uh, you're still carrying the risk anyway. Oh, weird. Ours is just, um, we can get, get onto it in a minute, but it seems like the, the PI insurance just keeps going up and up and up. Each uh, each year. So, how, how does that work? How does that work for you know, advisors in 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 your in your license? Is is that, that that cost? I would assume gets passed through to the advisors. No, we we kind of, we we pick the PI up as a, okay. as a group policy, and uh, we we pay it. Yep. So we include it in your licensing fee. We just wanted to keep the licensing fee quite simple. Yep. So we just have flat fee and a, and a um and um, an ongoing. Yeah, uh, smaller. It's not a sliding one. It's just a standard. We just have a, um, a small percentage based one, and we call the, the the percentage one based one is is just generally based on um, that's the percentage based costs that we're going to have to incur, things like PI and that sort of stuff, and so we just make that even across the board, and, yep. um, and then a flat fee. Yep. To 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 keep it simple, we got something. The PI thing for me is is just it's 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 a little bit out of control <laughs> because we're bearing the um, the PI insurers are still gum shy from. You know, the banks and the fee for no service and all the things that they got they got tarnished with and it's gonna be a bit like see it you know, compensation scheme of last resort and the ASIC uh, levy. Um the PI we're still paying for a really rough patch and uh, I'd argue that most of the license fees that are left at the moment weren't uh, weren't responsible for a lot of that damage, but we're still having to put the bill. Yeah. But yeah, you know, that's yeah, that's that's work. That's what the way we it- what it what is and then it's not necessarily in your business, but just in general, because there's there's a lot of I was looking through Ensemble and and some of the questions around licensing that people had been asking prior to us, you know, re- recording this, and lots of people talking about different prices from their licensee. You know, someone saying and these are some maybe older comments, but someone saying you know they're paying forty thousand, someone's paying fifty thousand, someone's paying sixty thousand. It seems like quite a quite a big range of of, uh, of of fees that people might be paying per per advisor. Do you have a sense of what I don't know what an average licensee fee might be per advisor. No, oh, look, I think we're I think we're a little bit on the cheap side. Yeah, we we charge thirty grand plus two percent. Yeah, okay, but uh, and that that covers everything. Yeah, but a lot of other ones do. They'll charge a flat fee or just a flat fee, but then add on PI and add on some other costs depending on on what company. You know, might have the ASIC levy separate and the and that sort of thing separate. And so there's a number of different costs along the way, and maybe different software. The other thing to remember too is it does that fee. Is, you know, a lot of cases that fee can be generally subsidised by uh, a product. Mm. So when you've got your own SMA or your own by a big licensee that has some product, then that that fee could be subsidised, or at least your licensee staff's income you know, could be subsidised by the by the product. And so that's you know, that helps, and it depends on who the profit is. You know, look, there's all this talk in the licensee world about how licenses can't make money. Mm. You know, I don't. My board will probably get upset with me for. Publicly saying this, but uh, we're quite profitable. <laughs> so um, as all of us, you know, so the majority of our advisors are shareholders, and those shareholders, uh, we still can return what a, a reasonable profit. Yeah, but, but you, th- I, I saw that on your website earlier. You know, I, the question I asked you about, you know, the with the advisors being part owners of the license, somewhere on your website, I, you know, I, I read that you were you were focused on having a a profitable standalone licensee business that's not necessarily subsidised by other. 
other things. It needs to be a standalone business in its own right. And then, hey, you invite some of the advisors along to be to be part owners of that business if they want it. And that, and look, as soon as they do that, then if we, you know, if they're complaining about the fees, then obviously they're picking it up at the profit margin as well. So it's a, it, you know, it's a, it's it's still it's still helpful. I mean, we've always, we started the, it's funny in the licensee level because we've had a couple of times a couple of people approach us to buy us. Mm. And I think that's what a lot of advisors are finding at the moment by going, this, the fear about going into a mid sized boutique is that they can, uh, it gets bought by, you know, one of the big players and all of a sudden you're back in the fire. Back to where you were, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, or back in the fire. Um, we, uh, we decided to, uh, our board, we actually decided to put a couple of caveats on the fact that we could be bought. And so if someone does buy us, they still have to, Adhere to our four, uh, four pillars, which are no conflicts, which we spoke about before. We don't want to have um, ever make money off a off a product. Um, we equity and control, which we spoke about. And obviously, the, client, the advisors can have equity, and you know they've still got they've still got full control of their own business. An interesting one is that uh, we don't mandate, so we don't mandate um, any software or any rules. So if we can you can justify as an advisor that it's within the regulatory guides and uh, within the Corporations Act. So uh, we're going to be we're going to be happy and support you in that. We'll actually put resources to help you to do that because we don't want to be, you know, we're, we're a business part. We don't want to be working with it. But the last one is, and the interesting one, um, it's uh, the, funnily enough, it needs a lot of interpretation these days, but is uh, we say that we trust you. So we, we trust our advisors. Yeah. Whatever they tell us, we trust them. Bit, uh, yeah, a bit different, I, I would think, to a, to a lot of other places. So you, you, you mentioned there about you don't, you know, not, not too concerned about what software um, advisors are using. Is it? Is it mainly X plan? Is it Rise of Logic? You've got a bit of mix of stuff. Well, when we originally started, we were picking up individual um, individual advice, so individual advice practices, and uh, we were realising that uh, you know the cost for X plan for a single practice, and you're not turning over that much money, was it was quite it's expensive. huge. Yeah, and so we were saying, well, hey, we hold a copy of X plan, and um, and we've got a couple of people that run it, and because they're only using it for two or three different models a year, or even five or six, we'll do the point. And so we just threw that in as part of our license. So we actually started picking up a bit of a tech stack ourselves that we could offer out to um, some of our um, some of our practices. So we so we offer a um, we we put out a CRM. So we own a CRM, and it's right, that's how we do our pays and all that sort of stuff. But if, apart from that, we've got um, I'd say that half of our practices don't use any software at all, yeah, right. other, other than the CRM. So you know, obviously, they can deal with the clients because I found. You know, this is I, I, we have quite a large resource in the Philippines because I was finding back when we were looking at this at uh, building this up, the cost of software was um, was getting ridiculous, and so I could actually throw labour at it more cheaply than I could buy the tech stack. Yeah, and then that became you know far more practical way of doing it. So we just we we, we put labour at it. So in terms of writing the advice, you know, if you whether well, your business is a Going down the video route or doing the old, you know, Word document PDF uh, uh, SOAs. So, so that's being written in the Philippines rather than being generated through an X plan license and then tidied up. It's being written elsewhere. No, but most most of the plans are done in onshore. Okay. So um, we basically we, we encourage advisors to you to outsource to their own people in Australia. We found the Philippines um, paraplaning service and offshore paraplaning we didn't find very good. Yep. And again, it was more software dependent. There's a couple of big, big uh, services in Australia that don't need any software at all. Yeah. You just fill it all. You just write down your strategy, do your um, your, your comparisons or whatever you're going to do, and you flick it to them. They, they do your plan on whatever software they're working on. Yeah, okay. So you don't need to have that software to run yeah. it. The only thing that we've always found difficult is point of sale modeling. You know, a lot of advisors want to either have something in front of their client to show them or be able to quickly do some models after the meeting so they can come up with uh, the most appropriate strategy. And that's that's always been hard to get good modeling software that's just standalone software. Yeah, yeah. Everything's tapped in with, you know, 50 other a la carte uh, services that not, don't necessarily make a lot of sense. Mm. Yeah. Whenever they get used. So, so, then the, so then the data transition that, you know, I guess we're kind of talking about what's involved in the process. There's understanding what your old licensee has in terms of how long you know, your resignation period is and, and what's required from there and whether you need to issue new advice. There's the data transition. So if I'm coming from an X plan, and we use X plan here, so I'm kind of familiar with it. If I'm coming from an X plan world where all of my client records and phone numbers and CRM and everything's stored in there, what's the data transition like to your systems? Well, so, so we use Work Sorted. They're a, um, a mob out of um, Adelaide. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty good, pretty simple. But they'll just 
they'll ask you to get an export from X plan and uh, and then they'll code it up to go into theirs. I think it's about fifteen hundred bucks each way. Yeah. And the X plan will charge you about fifteen hundred bucks and then the uh, the new one will charge you about fifteen hundred dollars to put it in. But generally these dates the data is a lot better. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, you know, we got really scared years ago and I, I still I still hold the same feeling as that I want to hold my own data. Like I need the CRM to sort it and control it and be able to do my, my mail outs and things. But things like all of my documents that I've sent to clients and, you know, everything that I hold with regard to client, I want to keep that myself. And so, you know, we encourage things like a Dropbox or, you know, or OneDrive or some, something like that that you're actually in control of and you just keep the data that you need in the CRM. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I could. That's resonating with because you, you kind of end up, you end up then almost trapped into that CRM where you know we, we use Xplan, everything's in Xplan. We we uh, right. we generate advice in Xplan. We do modelling in Xplan. The client's phone numbers in Xplan. The last ten years worth of anything that we've sent to the clients in Xplan. And so when Xplan turns around and says, "Oh, we're increasing your license fee by fifty percent," it's like, "Oh, oh well, you just kind of just have to cop it." But uh, yeah, and you're not nimble enough either yeah. to be able to move to somewhere else. Like if it buys a loads, it becomes great or Pluto soft. Mm. So you don't get out of uh, Western Australia becomes really uh, they become the best. Which it's hard to move. It's it's, it's really difficult. And you've got to draw a line of the sand and say, okay, I'm just going to pause everything there and do everything going forward. Which mm. often is the the best way to do it. So what do you what do you think the timeframes are then? If we look at like there's these different areas of I mean, main areas of things that need to be dealt with, and you and you mentioned you know the, the platforms and so forth will take their time in switching advisor codes over to the to the new licensee. But what do you think the time period might be of of me saying, hey, I'm going to leave wherever whatever licensee I am to being up and running on on the new one? What do you what do you think the time period might be? Look, I'd, I'd say you could reasonably easily expect to do it in four to six weeks. Yeah, right. And most and most uh, most licensees only have a thirty day um, termination clause on their on your license. So um, yeah, it's generally pretty easy to move across. So um, fr- from that perspective, it's not too bad. Then it'll be probably another ninety days before all of your money starts coming across to you. Yep. But as you know, my both you know, payments teams will make sure that that money comes across and they get that sorted out. So you know, you, it just takes a little bit of headspace. And once you've got in there, you've got to make sure that you spend a day or two per week getting the thing done and not getting cooked up in your, uh, in your normal advice things. It's the, I think it's the investment in time to make it. I've never had someone, though, who's moved across, and this, this is to any license that even in my experience said, ah, oh, that was the worst thing I ever did from a time perspective. Yeah. I think, yeah. Because generally, the reason that you're moving is because there's something there that's not working. And if that's not working, it's going to stay not working forever. You know, their distribution team's going to say, "Oh no, it's okay, James. It's fine. It'll be, it'll be all good." But, uh, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be uh, niggling at you, at whatever that is, for for in perpetuity. So, you know, it's time to they bite the bullet and get the job done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at a quieter time, maybe something that uh, it's a little bit quieter, like February or something like that, when things aren't, aren't going crazy. Yeah. So, is do you do you then on on your side of people joining your license? Do you find there's a busier time for people joining you through through the year? No, nah, it's completely random. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think, oh, no, I'll change at 30 June yeah. and I'll do everything I can to say, don't do that. It's the worst time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, well, it's not so bad these days, but it used to always be that you're for quite busy 30 June. Yeah, but these days, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is generally a busier time because there's a lot of reviews come up around that time. What we do is, you know, I've just decided that to, I want to make it as easy as possible and we're trying to – I'm, I'm looking to talk to business partners, so I generally throw as much resources as we can. So we have a deal. So I've got, uh, you know, some of my support team in the Philippines is specifically designed to help practices because we get, you, each advisor gets 10 hours of free back office support each month. We just throw that in. And so we actually use that resource to get you across. So they'll get your FSG up to running and, you know, your business cards, if you're still using those, you're making sure all your documents, your websites and that sort of stuff are done. So uh, because, again, we have that expertise, so we do uh, hold your hand. We've got a, a girl there that's really good at it and she holds your hand as you come across. But depending on who you're going to, you know, the, how the level of service. I think a lot of a lot of licensees at the moment have quite comprehensive off-boarding teams <laughs> and, not, and, and not such big on-boarding teams. <laughs> so it doesn't sound – look, they, I appreciate the chat because it doesn't, it doesn't sound as scary as what I thought it would have been. So from you know, from some of the posts that I've read on, on Ensemble and, and just talking to others in the industry, I, I got the sense that changing license was – was was this big scary task that's never ending, and you know, is, you know, when are we going to see the end of this thing? But it doesn't sound like it's quite as 
daunting, maybe. I, I'm not as scared now, having spoken to you, I guess, than what I, I might have been speaking on, to you. I think it's dependent on where you want to go, though, James. See, some of the licensees have a lot of rules. Mm. And if they've got a lot of rules, it's going to take a while to, to bet in. But if you're going to someone who's a little bit more boutique, which you know most of the new licensees are, then uh, yeah, they, they're going to make it easy for you. Anything else that we haven't covered that you think would be of value? Oh, look, uh, no, I think we've covered just about everything. Look, the only thing is that, uh, and I, I read some stuff over the weekend that, uh, you know, and you know, aware of the big push at the moment is that to try and get, um, get it to a place where all of our advisors are working solo for a client. And what I'm saying is that is that so they're not working for an AFSL and they're not working for a product. And if we push in that space, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to the, the place that we want to be. And that's going to align with what everybody wants around here. But I think it comes back to each individual advisor not trying to influence the, you know, Steve Jones or trying to, trying to influence everything else. Just get to a point where you can work for your client without any restrictions. Sounds like a ideal place to be. Uh, Luke, David, thank you for joining me this morning to uh, to record this. If anyone wants to reach out to you, where can, we'll put some you know some links to your website and stuff in the show notes. But where can uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out? Um, Advice Evolution. So we're, I'm just David at Advice Evolution, and uh, we have Brooke with my, my team, and everything can get up. But we uh, you should be able to Google us. So I think we're doing some stuff in Google at the moment. So we might come up here <laughs> really up on the top of the uh, the search thing there. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, we'll, we'll be definitely all in uh, listening at the uh, the the, uh, the ensemble uh, PD day. Yep, you guys got big shoes to fill after last year. That was such a, such a, a big event last yeah, year. Yeah, like- well, uh, it's moved. As I said, by the time this is uh, this has gone live, the, the event will have probably happened. It's uh, moved somewhere else. I'm go- so I'm in Melbourne, but I'm um, I'm going up for it uh, on on Friday. It's at a different hotel somewhere or other. I've just got to work out where to get how to get there from the airport. Um, but yeah, I was, I was talking to Emily, and it's a whole, you know, a whole, an even bigger production than than what the last ones were. So I'm looking forward to see what they've got organised. Uh, it should be a good day. Oh, it's, it's an outstanding, outstanding resource for us for, for the for the advice world. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely, definitely valuable for BT advisors for sure. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, David. Good to chat with you. Catch up with you another time. Thank you.